somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Et qui défendait la liberté d'expression. The moment you limit free speech is not free speech. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, a history of free speech by Jakob Mshengama. Clear and Present Danger relies on the generous support of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Fridor, and the Politiken Foundation. It's a great privilege to be joined by Professor Peter Adamson for the second expert opinion of the series. Peter Adamson is Professor of Philosophy at the Munich School of Ancient Philosophy, University of Munich, and the author of a number of books, including on the great Arabic philosopher Al-Kindi, and an upcoming book on the Persian polymath Razi, whom we met in episode five on the Caliphate. But perhaps Peter Adamson is best known for being the indefatigable host of the podcast A History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, which very modestly aims to cover the entire history of philosophy across the globe. As I speak, Peter has produced 298 episodes, and we're still in the early days of the Renaissance. So, Peter, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm going to try not to go too deep into the philosophical discussions that you normally uh, delve into on your show, uh, not least because I'd be completely out of my depth pretty quickly. Instead, I'll try to focus on, on free thinking and, and free thinkers with a particular focus on medieval Islam and Christianity, which were also the, the themes of the last two ordinary episodes uh, of, of my podcast. But, but one thing um, that I found doing this podcast and doing the research and uh, delving into the history of free speech, or rather what would become free speech in the modern era, is that it, it seems almost impossible to look at the different time periods in, in isolation. So for instance, Greek philosophy and science were major themes in both medieval Islamic and Christian thought. And so I was wondering if you have done some thinking about free thinking in general? I mean, uh, are there any commonalities across the, the ages? How should we define it? What are the origins and, and the impact and so on? Yeah, well, so as you've covered in your series already, there is something we could think about as a tradition of free speech in ancient Greece, in particular associated with Athenian democracy. And we see that turning up in philosophy, especially philosophical movements where the protagonists sort of give themselves the right to say anything they want to anybody. And the classic example of this would be the cynics. So you have Diogenes the cynic criticizing and making fun of aristocrats, random passersby, and even in this famous story, Alexander the Great, where Alexander comes and says, is there anything I can do for you? And Diogenes says, yeah, you can stop blocking my sunlight, right? So the idea that anyone can say anything to anybody is something that we associate with ancient philosophy. It's worth bearing in mind that that was one of the many ways in which the cynics and other philosophers, including the Stoics, would have been setting themselves up as critics of normal society, right? So by being so impolite and critical of the highborn, they were doing the same sort of things that they, the same sort of thing they were doing when they, for example, had sex in public or lived in the open or whatever. So as part of their kind of countercultural posture, it's not necessarily a common way of living and being in the ancient world. And as Greek philosophy gets passed on to these other cultures, they certainly are aware of that. So just to stay with the same example, the cynics and the anecdotes that are told about them were known in the Arabic speaking world and the Latin speaking so world. That's something that they know about and kind of admire, or at least they enjoy telling the stories. So for, for, for all the Greek science and philosophy that was translated and, and discussed in the Abbasid Caliphate, there was not really a recognized culture of free speech such as had been enjoyed by the Athenians. I mean, as far as I can tell, there was no explicit acknowledgement of Parisia and cer certainly not of, of, of Isigoria. But when you study the sources, what's your impression of the, the level of free discourse in, say, 9th or 10th century Baghdad, how, how far could you go when discussing religion and politics? I would say astoundingly far. 
and the obvious contrast here, which your listeners are in a good position to make now because you've already covered both cultures, would be the Islamic world and Latin Christendom, in part because there's no central church in Islamic culture. There isn't uh, nearly as much of an authority or any kind of institution of authority that can come and clamp down on what people say about religion uh, or philosophical topics for that matter. And you also covered the famous Mihna, the Inquisition or test in which the Abbasid Caliphs tried to require people under their political domination to sign up to a certain theological doctrine, namely that the Quran is created. And it's quite telling, I think, that not only was that resisted, but it was successfully resisted. So, I mean, we, you can point to, in fact, you did point to that as an example of constraints being placed on free speech, and it was certainly that, but it's notable because it was an exceptional case. And in general, the caliphs don't seem to have had much success in trying to sort of uh, control the way people thought or spoke about theological, religious, philosophical topics especially not in comparison to the way things were in Latin Christendom and also the Byzantine Empire. So I would say of the medieval cultures, so and there I just mean the Greek-speaking Byzantine culture, the Latin-speaking uh, European culture, and the Islamic world. Um, the Of those three, there's much more freedom of thought and speech in the Islamic world than there are in the other two. You mentioned yourself the, the Mihnas. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. In Abbasid times, you have against the Sandaka, the sort of the heresy aimed perhaps at Manichaeans, but sort of becoming more generic term. And then most famously in, in 833, when Caliph al-Mamun forbade opposition to the, to the doctrine that the Quran was created, the red lines seem pretty arbitrary. Should we see them mostly as political or religious, or is it impossible to distinguish between the two? Yeah, of course, those two things always kind of go hand in hand, even today, politics and religion. But I, I would read it more as political rather than as uh, purely religious because of something you actually mentioned, I think, if I'm remembering your episode right. So there's a kind of uh, contest for authority between the caliph and the so-called ulama, the religious scholars. And if you are asking yourself, well, why would the caliphs care whether people think the Quran is created or not? One idea that modern day scholars have had is that if you say that the Quran is uncreated, so it's basically divine or an aspect of God, maybe an attribute of God, like God's word, then you're raising it to a very high level. And that means that you're implicitly raising the experts who understand this text and you're raising them to a correspondingly high level, maybe even to the point that they can challenge the authority of the caliph. So one idea is that the caliph was trying to assert religious authority uh, against and over religious textual scholars. This would go together with something else that's generally true of the Abbasids, which is that they tried to claim legitimacy through other, basically by giving themselves various um, religious qualifications, for example, relationship to the prophet. So the idea was less that they were, for example, just powerful warlords who had come into power and more that they'd been chosen by God. And so maybe there's a little bit more of an idea that you get in Europe, for example, with the divine right of kings. They're sort of edging towards that without making exactly the same claims. And the Mihna is an expression of that attitude, I would say. So to me, it's at core, it's a political issue and less of a religious issue. If there was no sort of articulated concept of, of free speech, but rather, you could say, a, t a tolerance of divergent religious ideas, I, I found some examples that come sort of close, I would say, to recognizing the idea, at least when I, when I read them as, as a non-specialist. Th there was a quote from Al-Kindi that I used in the podcast where he writes basically that, that you shouldn't be ashamed of appreciating the truth and acquiring it, uh, whether it comes from, you know, from different races uh, and nations, uh, and that uh, for the seeker of truth, nothing takes precedence over the truth. So to me, that seemed quite significant because that very explicitly also uh, 
says, you know, people who are unbelievers, uh, people who are non-Arabs, non-Muslims, their ideas have value uh, as well. So that suggests sort of an openness to to other uh, ideas. Well, let me say the reason I agree with you, and then I'll say the reason I disagree with you. So you're right that what Kendi is doing there is defending his right, in a sense, or everyone's right, to appropriate ideas from non-Muslim societies, and in particular from the pagan Greeks. So he's ultimately, he's thinking mostly of Aristotle here. And what he's saying is, well, if Aristotle is right, then surely we can't object to it, because how can you object to the truth, right? However, and here's where the caveat would come in, notice the implication there, which is that if Aristotle was wrong, then we would have no reason to appropriate his ideas. So he's not saying, let's take over and examine all ideas. He's saying, let's take the true parts and leave the false parts. And that actually is, I mean, he doesn't emphasize the the leaving the false parts because his whole uh, kind of career is built around the idea of importing ideas from Greek culture. But actually, the idea of sort of picking and choosing ideas from pagan philosophy and just taking the parts that fit with an Abrahamic religious framework, that's something that we already saw in late antiquity quite a lot with Christian church fathers. So they even use this biblical image of despoiling the Egyptians, so stealing the Egyptians' valuables. And the idea is that you- This hand, handmaiden role. Yeah. So you go and you take the good stuff and you leave the rest. So we shouldn't uh, see Al-Kindi as a, a John Stuart Mill? Definitely not. I don't think so. It's a narrower openness to to foreign ideas rather than saying everything should be discussed and, and then we can ourselves figure out what is true and what is false. Yeah, that actually maybe goes back to what your original question, which I didn't exactly answer, which is like, what is what is it to value free speech in general? And I think one way of thinking about it is that you value free speech in general if you're in favor of people being able to say things that you wish they weren't saying. Because anybody can say, anyone can be happy to let people they agree with say that these things that they agree with, right? It's when people are saying things you don't agree with that your commitment to free speech is tested. And what I would say in the Islam, in the Islamic context is that typically the question of people's right to say things never came up one way or another. So you you greet truth with agreement, you greet untruth with disdain and counter argument, but you don't usually greet untruth with arrest and execution um, or sanction or requiring the person to appear before a court, maybe burning their book in front of them. These are all things that happen in Latin medieval Christendom. Um, and those things genu- generally, generally do not happen in the Islamic world with some exceptions, as you said in your episode. Yeah, so so it's more of a free speech, if we can use that term in, in this period, is more negatively stated in the absence of persecution of uh, a number of, of ideas that could be even though they didn't rest on an acknowledged right to hold those ideas. That's right. It's more of just an absence of an institution that thinks its job is to do anything about it, Yeah, I would say. It's not because everyone thinks, oh, isn't it great that we live in this culture where everyone can say whatever they want. Yeah. In a way, that brings us to what, to me, in a sense, is the most interesting idea in Islamic culture if we're thinking about free speech. There's a word, taklid, which I'm very interested in. So taklid is hard to translate. It means something like uncritical acceptance of authority. So you engage in taklid if you believe in or say something just because some authoritative person said so. And one of the very common things we find intellectuals across the board in the Islamic world, also even non-Muslims saying, is that as intellectuals and scholars, they have this deeply held value that you should not engage in taklid. So for them, there's sort of two classes of people, the so-called people of taklid, which are like normal people. So for example, illiterate people, which is most people, of course, in that culture. And then there's this high level of elite, the intellectual scholars. And what distinguishes them is that the intellectual scholars think for themselves and everyone else doesn't, nor should they, right? Because they don't have the training to make up their own mind. And 
I think this is actually very interesting. And in a way, um, what for us is a debate that's always uh, put in terms of free speech or free thought is for them put in terms of being critical with respect to authority or not critical in the sense of thinking about it and deciding whether the authority is right. And basically what these scholars are saying is that what it means to be an intellectual and a scholar in Islamic society is precisely that you don't engage in taklid, so you do make up your own mind. You were kind enough to send me a draft chapter from your from your upcoming book on, on Razi. I presented Razi as a radical free thinker who basically rejects reveal religion and prophecy, though without being an, an atheist. You take a different view of him. Could you explain why you, you do that? Sure. Yeah, okay, so first of all, the thing to realize here is that the textual situation is very difficult because we have two kinds of information about Razi. We have a few works of his that are actually extant. So in other words, they survive. But there are, well, we have a lot of works by him about medicine that survive, and then a very small number about philosophy. And they don't really tell us very much about what he thought about religion, with a couple of exceptions, which I'll get back to in a second. Then we have reports by other authors about what he said. And in particular, there's a very detailed report of a debate that another contemporary thinker had with Razi, in which this other guy says, I met Razi, I had an argument with him, and I've also read his book. Here's what he said in the argument with me, and here's what it says in his book. And this is the main, in fact, pretty much original and only source, because I think other other texts that report on Razi's apparently heretical views probably all go back to this one book. And what he says is precisely the usual take on Razi, namely that Razi was a free thinker, like in a bad way, right? So he said that the Quran was garbage, that revealed religion is is all charlatanry and it's all fraudulent. And the Christians have mistakes in their scripture. Uh, he's not impressed by Islam either, blah, 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 right? So that's the usual take you get on Razi. And this is what most scholars think that Razi was doing, which of course is incredibly surprising, right? I mean, to say that it's surprising is there's almost no words to say how surprising it would be, which doesn't mean it's impossible because as we've said, you could get away with a lot um, in the ninth and 10th century. But he, if so, he got away with much more than most, right? Now, but then there's a problem. So for one thing, we don't have any trace of that in his extant writings. And in fact, in a work we mentioned just a bit ago, The Doubts About Galen, at one point it mentions a book by Galen that he really likes. And he says, this is the best book, the most useful book that there is, except, of course, for the Quran. Now, okay, maybe someone put that in, like a, a later scribe inserted it out of piety, but at least the text looks like he's saying that the Quran is the best book that exists. And in addition to that, there's a, a later author who's not nearly as hostile towards Razi, who reports more about what Razi said. This was discovered by a French scholar named Marwan Rashad. And in this report, um, this later author shows Razi arguing that his own philosophical theories are all paralleled in the Quran and in reports about the prophet, so that Islamic religious tradition is in agreement with his own philosophy, which is a kind of strange thing for him to be doing if this other report about him being a heretic were true. So in my forthcoming book, I argue that, um, for, so obviously you can't believe all of this, right? It's inconsistent, I would say. So to me, it seems most likely that the incredibly hostile witness that we have is the one that we shouldn't trust. And I, so I, what I argue in the forthcoming book is that this hostile was misrepresenting Razi's views and that what Razi was really doing was attacking this witness and his school uh, because he's a Shiite, actually. And what he's accusing the Shiites of is precisely taklid. So he's saying, you guys engage in uncritical acceptance of authority because you all follow these imams, the descendants of Ali, but you should be n not engaging in taklid. You should think for yourself. And I think that probably if you asked him what he thought about the Quran, he would have said what most philosophers would have said, namely, it's true because it agrees with philosophy. 
And in fact, lo and behold, we have this later report where he says exactly that. So I think probably he he was attacking like a certain way of being religious or a certain way of authority bound religious life. And one of the targets of his attack took revenge by misrepresenting that as if it were an attack on revealed religion in general. So I just don't believe the source, although I think that the source's attack is based on some things that Ozzy really did say to him. He's just misrepresenting the target. In your chapter, you do quote a famous Razi quote where he basically goes on to sort of mockingly dismiss the Quran as full of contradiction and, and useless stories. And you write something along the line that, that some of Razi's criticism was not really that exceptional. It was, I think you used the word standard and cliche at the time, which, which really surprised me. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, so so for example, one of the things that the opponent describes Razi as um, dismissing is the idea that the Quran is inimitable. In other words, nobody could write anything that good. And we tend to think that that's like a very standard piece of Islamic doctrine that no Muslim could reject. But actually, it came into Islamic belief later. It was only just appearing at around this time. And what Razi is doing there, I think, is to say something like, well, you sh if you believe in the Quran, you shouldn't believe in it because it's miraculous. You shouldn't believe anything because of miracles. You should believe it because it's true. So again, he's, he's imposing a kind of philosophical bar for belief rather than a kind of mystical bar or the bar that, you know, you should follow whichever prophet can perform the best miracles. So he, I think he definitely poured scorn on that idea. We have very little surviving material from another notorious person called Rwandi who seemed to reject a revealed religion and, and who became sort of a hated target by, by traditionalists and, and even mainstream philosophers. But you're basically saying that, that Rasi is not in the same league as the scraps that we have from Rwandi. Yeah, one implication of what I said is the juries are even out on Rwandi because these are, I mean, in both cases, you've got reports of incredibly hostile witnesses. So like, imagine if centuries from now, the only thing anyone knew about Hillary Clinton was excerpts from Donald Trump's speeches. So you would think that she was like this. Uh, a lot of people do think this, actually. You'd think that she was like this nefarious criminal who somehow managed to miraculously avoid being arrested, right? And you would have no you have no access to the other side, right? Or vice versa, right? So imagine that all you knew about Donald Trump is what you can read in The Guardian, right? So you, you'd get only one side of the story, and that's what's happening here, except even worse, it's very much evidence. Um, in the case of Razi, I think that there is some other evidence that balances out the hostile portrayal and casts doubt on it, and that seems to be less the case with Rwandi, but that doesn't mean that the hostile portrayal of Rwandi is true. I mean, there's a kind of irony here, actually, right? Because we tend to get excited when ideas are ascribed to someone that in the context were being ascribed to them precisely to make them sound as shocking and appalling as possible. So the more shocking they sound, the more we think, oh my God, this guy's amazing, right? But that's certainly not the intent of those texts. The intent of the text is to make it sound like they were evil, wrong. I hate it when scholars uh, explode these great myths. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's professional hazard. Um, you... <laughs> You mentioned yourself Ghazali and his attack on the Aristotelian philosophers and his rather drastic solution for dealing with sort of three or four specific propositions that he found uh, constituted apostasy and that basically people should be killed yeah, even without chance to repent. And so there's been this tradition to see Ghazali as an arch-villain who was responsible for, for the decay of Arab philosophy. But again, scholars have pushed back against this picture What's your, what's your verdict on, on Ghazali vis-a-vis -vis sort of freedom of thought? Uh, how should we see his legacy? So again, I think that there's a, a kind of two sides to the story here. Uh, so first of all, regarding his attempt to kind of clamp down on what people can say and believe, there's been a lot of uh, really good work done on that by a scholar named Frank Griffel, who's at Yale University. And he argues that Ghazali actually represents a real turning point in attempts to define orthodoxy in the Islamic world because Ghazali wrote this work called The Incoherence of the Philosophers, as you mentioned in your show. 
that uh, attacks Avicenna, who at that point was the most important philosopher in the Islamic world. And Ghazali criticizes him on many, many points and then says at the end, but there's three things that he says that are actually unbelief. So for example, that God cannot perform miracles or that there's no bodily resurrection. And he says that whereas Avicenna is wrong on the other points that he's covered, on these three points, he's not just wrong, but he's fallen into unbelief. So something else you mentioned in your episode is that there was this very technical legal notion of unbelief where someone actually was an apostate, right? So he's he's basically moved away from Islam. So for example, by converting to another religion and you're supposed to give them a chance to recant, right? Explain to them what will happen if they don't recant and then they have to refuse to recant, right? Uh, so what, what Ghazali is saying here is a kind of novel idea, which is that by denying some core truths of Islam, Avicenna, who certainly thought of himself as a Muslim, there's no doubt about that, he's saying that Avicenna effectively fell into a position of apostasy and unbelief by teaching false philosophical doctrines. And Gurfil argues, and I think he's probably right about this, that nobody had done that before. So no one had identified these specific philosophical theses or any philosophical theses as being constitutive of unbelief and therefore punishable by death. It would be more like if you openly said, I'm leaving Islam. Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm becoming a Jew. Or openly yeah. mark the, 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 the prophet rather than just having sort of heterodox yeah, views. Yeah, right. I mean, I suppose that if you came along and said, oh, by the way, I don't believe in God, that would count as apostasy as well. But you, I think usually apostasy would mean converting to another religion in this context. Not, and not certainly not something like denying a particular theological doctrine within Islam, right? Okay, so that's one side of the story. The other side of the story, though, is that, and this I think is what people tend to forget about Ghazali, is that he's not saying that about all of Avicenna's philosophy. So even most of the things he disagrees with Avicenna about, he doesn't think that they rise to the level of things Avicenna is wrong. So this would be much more like what we've seen in other thinkers. They're just arguing back and forth, right? Uh, but in addition to that, there's all the things in Avicenna's philosophy that Ghazali doesn't criticize at all. And in fact, uh, one way of reading the incoherence of the philosophers is that he's implicitly saying everything the philosophers say that's not mentioned in this book is fine. <laughs> and that might seem like a ridiculously optimistic reading, but actually I think that it, it must be right because, for example, there's another work where Ghazali defends the use of logic, which is one of the major tools of the philosopher, and says that people who don't think that logic is acceptable are just being silly. So he's clearly committed to the idea that some of what's come down for the philosophical tradition is to be welcomed, and some of it is not. Some of it is just wrong. Some of it is actually unbelief. So there's kind of three categories here. There's the true stuff, the false stuff, and the stuff that's not just false, but consistent unbelief. And the unbelief part is very small. It's only these three theses that are mentioned at the end of the incoherence. And then the question is, how much of Avicenna's philosophy does he think is false and how much is true? And in fact, what you see in subsequent centuries is people fighting over exactly that question. So there's a lot of debate about Avicenna's philosophy and which parts of it are right, which parts of it are wrong. And there's views taken pretty much on every point in the spectrum. Um, so I don't think that, in a way, I don't actually think that Ghazali's most influential move there is the point about apostasy. His most influential move there is to invite later thinkers to sort out Avicenna's philosophy into the true part and the false part, which they then start doing for centuries with great enthusiasm. I want to move towards uh, Latin Christendom, and and one way to do that is to to pick up on Averroes, uh, who had a, had a huge impact on Western thought. He, of course, was in in, in Spain, not around Baghdad, where we've been. But he got into trouble uh, at, at home, and so did his European followers uh, later on. Can you briefly, if that's possible, explain why Averroes was so influential, why he was so controversial, and, and how he got into to, to trouble? Yeah, so he's um, mostly important because he's the greatest medieval commentator on Aristotle, which is a kind of a weird thing for him to have been because he's living in the Islamic world in the 12th century. So he's, as you said, he's in Muslim Spain, Al-Andalus. And 
by the 12th century, we've already had Avicenna one and a half centuries before. So this is a little bit like someone making a silent movie in the 1970s. It's like, why are you still thinking about Aristotle? We've moved on. Everyone's like, I just said, everyone's thinking about Avicenna, but the explanation for that, I guess, at least partially is because, well, partially he's trying to undo the damage done by Avicenna. So his way of reacting to Avicenna is to say, let's go back to Aristotle. And also it's because he's out in Spain, not in the Eastern parts of the sort of Islamic heartlands. And so he's doing what in effect is a very, um, basically an outmoded uh, kind of philosophy that's already become obsolete in the East, but which for the Latin Christian world was incredibly new and exciting because they were just getting the works of Aristotle translated from Arabic and Greek into Latin around the late 12th century and 13th century. He died in 1198. So his commentaries turn up in exactly the right time and place in order to come into the Latin speaking world and give them guidance for understanding Aristotle, which for them is the exciting thing, is trying to come to grips with Aristotle. They have to come to a grips with Avicenna as well, but for them, Aristotle is the central thinker as he had been for Averroes. Um, I think Averroes does not get in trouble the way that Ghazali wanted Avicenna to get in trouble. Um, by the way, maybe we should have said that when Ghazali criticized Avicenna, that was after Avicenna was dead. Yeah. So he wasn't actually like <laughs> saying anything that could have- not a, It was not a death warrant. No, exactly. Um, but in the case of Averroes, it's, it's not even like someone during or after his lifetime was saying, oh, here's some specific thesis of yours that um, apostasy or his unbelief. It's more like he was just- uh, allied with a, with a, the political regime and then the winds of the regime changed and so he was out can you delve more into what was the significance of Averroes and and also the other muslim thinkers and, and scientists who were were being translated into latin in, in 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 these times what was the impact on intellectual life in latin christendom of the, these islamic thinkers It was huge uh, because of the reason I just mentioned. Uh, the, so you have um, kind of two phases of medieval philosophy in Latin Christendom. You have an early phase, which basically runs up to the late 12th century, where they don't have very much Aristotle. They only have a few logical works translated into Latin. So they're mostly using those. Uh, they're thinking about Augustine and other church fathers. Obviously, they're thinking about the Bible. And you have some pretty famous characters here, like Anselm, who invented a famous proof for the existence of God called the ontological argument. You have Abelard, who's a great logician. Um, but you don't have the kind of full engagement with Aristotelian philosophy that becomes possible around the year 1200. And that happens in the first instance because of translations from Arabic. Then once they get their hands on that material, they think, oh, this is fantastic. We really need to get our hands on the Greek manuscripts. We're able to do that by sending people to Constantinople, getting Greek manuscripts there and translating them into Latin. So you have a huge influx of Aristotelian philosophy into the Latin speaking world in the late 12th and 13th centuries. And the rest of medieval philosophy, so 13th, 14th century or so, is to some extent the story of people trying to come to grips with all of that. And one of the ways that they do it is by turning to Muslim philosophers, and in particular Avicenna and Averroes, as the most important guides to this material. Averroes here is a more straightforward guide because he actually just wrote these long commentaries on Aristotle. They were translated into Latin, into Hebrew, and so on. Um, and they're very, very influential. Someone like Thomas Aquinas, for example, would probably literally have been reading Aristotle in the form of Averroes' commentary, and or at least with a commentary next to the Aristotle on his desk. And when he comments on and discusses Aristotle, you, you can see that he's doing that. You can see because he keeps saying, and the commentator says on this passage, blah, 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 the commentator being Averroes. And then he might also mention what Avicenna says on the same topic. Avicenna is a bit more complicated because he didn't write commentaries on Aristotle. He wasn't interested in doing that. Um, so they need to kind of come to grips with Avicenna's thoughts separately. Um, so really the way that medieval philosophy unfolded in the 13th century, especially, is unimaginable without this contact with the Islamic world. There, again, we see 
how these uh, different time periods are sort of interwoven together from uh, antiquity to the Islamic world and so on onto the, the, the Christian world, meaning that it's difficult to, to look at them completely separate. Yeah, definitely. So that's something I try to emphasize in the podcast as well, and also in my teaching that really, I mean, people always think of medieval philosophy as this land after ancient philosophy, because when they encounter it in university, they think, okay, well, there's Plato, Aristotle, and then Aquinas, right? Or maybe Augustine and Aquinas, and that's kind of it. That's all that they cover. But actually what you have is philosophy um, proceeding through the antique world all the way up to late antiquity and the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And then you have a kind of fragmentation into different languages, which get different pieces of the Greek inheritance. So the Byzantines have everything because they have all the Greek manuscripts. And in fact, the only reason we can read any of the stuff in Greek now is because the Byzantines copied it in their uh, manuscript tradition. Then you have the Islamic world, which knows a lot about ancient philosophy because they translate so much of it into Arabic. And you have the Latin Christian world in Europe, which doesn't know very much until they get it back from Arabic and Greek. So you have this kind of dispersion of Greek philosophy across the whole Mediterranean and beyond. And that, by the way, is not even looking at smaller traditions in different languages like Syriac, Armenian, and Giz, this Ethiopian language. So it really disseminates across almost the whole world, not not India and China, but um, as far from like, at least from, let's say the tip, the at the Western edge from Spain, all the way out to Central Asia and down into Africa as well. Says something about the power of ideas, I guess. You mentioned yourself, Peter Abelard. So now we're jumping a bit back in time because I want to focus a bit, like I said, on, on Latin Christendom. It's difficult not to sort of fall a little bit in love with with, with Peter Abelard um, because he's such a fascinating story. But maybe in my last episode, I didn't do a great job in spelling out uh, how in addition to being pretty insufferable and megalomaniac, uh, his ideas were so controversial. I mean, he was he was at least twice condemned. Would you see him as a, a free thinker? Yeah, maybe as close as the 12th century has to one anyway, in Latin Christendom. Uh, so he's obviously very confident in intellectual abilities, and we should say rightly so. So I, I'm more with, I'm with you and Heloise. It's hard not to fall in love with him. Um, <laughs> and the because he's so confident in his uh, abilities, he gets into lots of intellectual disputes, not all of which are about theological topics. So in fact, um, at least among philosophers, the thing that he's most famous for is his position in the debate about the status of universals. So basically what that means is like, there's all these different things in the world that are human. And now we want to know, well, what about humanity as such, like humanity, the universal property of humanity that you have and I have and everyone listening to this has. Is that another thing in the world or is it something that's only in our minds or what? And he has a particular view on that, which he argued for very effectively uh, against his rivals. And the problem is that he then took the same combative attitude and self-confident attitude when it came to theology. And he wrote theological works, which took fairly daring views on certain subjects. Um, they were slapped down and he responded to that by just writing them again. <laughs> and so he got slapped down again. So he's uh, definitely uh, a pretty bold theologian. But on the other hand, a lot of theologians are bold in the in the medieval period. So I mean, before I said that the freedom of thought and expression is much more available in the Islamic world than Latin Christendom, and that's true. But I think people have a tendency to assume that because of that, medieval philosophers in Latin Christendom just kind of always said the same stuff, like they could only sort of adhere to the line that was dictated by the church. And so they only ever make kind of little tiny technical points in philosophy that might be interesting, but they don't actually challenge the status quo at all or come in with new ideas. There's a kind of standard view of medieval philosophy. And this is entirely false. And one reason that it's false is that in a di I mean, there's certainly this threat of sanction that's kind of lurking in the background, especially starting in the late 12th century for various reasons. In particular, um, they have the crusade against the Cathars that kind of um, raises the bar on what you're allowed to do to people for having the wrong beliefs. 
like you're allowed to burn them to death and destroy their cities, for example. And they start taking that approach in uh, Paris as well. So for example, there's a female philosopher who was put to death in the early 14th century because they didn't like her book. So it can certainly happen. Um, and there's a lot of pressure thus being brought to bear on people to adhere to acceptable doctrine. But we have to bear in mind that there are other institutional pressures that are encouraging them to be innovative. In particular, they are usually competing for students, and Abelard certainly was. So in his uh, kind of autobiogra autobiographical story of his own scholarly career and his relationship with Heloise, he makes it very clear that he was competing with these scholars he was debating with to attract students because the students bring in money and also reputation. And the same thing would have been true at the universities once the universities come along in the 13th century. So you as a university master are trying to get a reputation for being the most brilliant thinker on campus, so to speak, so that you get the smartest, most students. And that means that they're actually all under a lot of pressure to be innovative. So what I would say is that um, the real mind, the mindset of a medieval scholastic philosopher is probably something like this. Be as innovative and daring as you can without being too innovative and too daring. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, we jump a bit ahead. You mentioned universities, and, and it seems like the the combination of perhaps particularly Aristotelian philosophy and the universities as research institutions, if you like, institutionalizing these new ideas becomes a, a game changer. But there's obviously also some uneasiness in, in how far you should allow Aristotelian nat natural philosophy to, to go because it, it challenges Christian theology. Can you say something more about the relationship between Aristotelian natural philosophy and Christian theology? What are sort of the main problems for, for, for Christians at the time, being drawn to Aristotle, but at the same time seeing problems in it? Probably the biggest debate is the eternity of the world, because Aristotle, um, on some topics, you know, he's he's kind of hard to interpret. It's not always so clear what he thinks. So, for example, uh, we today would look at what he says about the soul and think, oh, he thinks the soul dies with the body. So surely the medievals would have had a problem with that. But the medievals just don't think that's what he thought. So they, they have a way of reading his works about the soul that make him say that the soul is immortal. So that's not really a problem. But when it comes to the eternity of the world, he could not possibly be more explicit that the world has always existed. And so you have an immediate problem here in that Christians want to believe that the world was created at a certain moment in time. So it certainly looks like that's what it says in the Bible. And in general, that's what they want to say. You have a, a very similar debate that unfolds in the Islamic world, although there, there are more philosophers who are willing to admit that the world might be eternal. And so that becomes one of the um, main issues that's raised in the famous condemnations that were handed down in Paris in 1277, where the masters of the Parisian university were forbidden from teaching certain subjects, or sorry, certain theses. So they can teach the subject, but they can't um, allow students to get away with believing that the world is eternal. But even more than that, it's like they shouldn't even let the students think that it's like a, a thesis that you might seriously entertain, right? As you know, the sort of arguments on both sides, right? Which is how we try to teach today. Usually they didn't want that being done with a thesis, like that the world is eternal. Going into those, uh, I mean, it's, it's 219 specific theses or propositions that are condemned by the Bishop of Paris in, in 1277. And I think in, in 1272, students of philosophy are also sworn sort of not to delve into theological issues. So, so it seems like there's a turf war between the natural philosophers and the theologians. How do you, how do you see the condemnations as part of that? Yeah, that's certainly part of the context. So you have in the in the um, universities, you have to bear in mind there are different faculties. So there would be the um, teachers who kind of introduce you to university life. And by the way, we're talking here about students who are teenagers. So I mean, the age of kids that would be at high school now, that's how old you are as a beginning university student. So you would then get your degree in arts and the arts faculty is basically like the high school teachers. So they teach you Latin, they teach you basics of logic, 
Um, they might teach you some mathematics. And the arts faculty doesn't get into theology at all, in theory. And then you can graduate to higher studies the way we might go on to do an MA or a PhD. Uh, and, and you would go on to study one of several possible disciplines, so theology, law, medicine. And one of the um, kind of turf wars here, as you put it, is what can the masters say about theology? Um, so you have, for example, a figure like John Buridan, who's a great philosopher of the 14th century. He chose deliberately, probably, to stay in the arts faculty because he was an expert in logic and natural philosophy. That's what he was interested in. And he, I think, wanted to be in a position to say, oh, all that theology stuff, that's above my pay grade. I don't really do that. I only do <laughs> logic and natural philosophy. But the problem here is that sometimes the masters would say things that sounded theologically problematic. And then they would say, well, within natural philosophy, we have arguments that show the world is eternal. Of course, we know it isn't. But if you want to know why not, then go ask a theologian. <laughs> Right, so so they would sort of say that there were limits to logic and natural. If you only had the resources of Aristotelian philosophy and no revelation, maybe you'd have good arguments for thinking that the world is eternal. And this is exactly the kind of thing that the Parisian authorities wanted to crack down on. So they didn't want to let the masters say things that were religiously problematic, and then try to weasel out of what they had just done by saying, "Well, hey, I'm only saying this with my natural philosophy hat on." If I had a theologian hat, then I would say something different. But until I get promoted to being in the theology faculty, I'm just a natural philosopher, right? This is really the, so it's very much a kind of institutional um, dispute or tension as well as an intellectual dispute. We're fast running out of time. Unfortunately, we could go, go on forever. I haven't exhausted my, my line of questions, but I want to finish off with uh, a bit of populism perhaps. If you were to make a top three of the boldest European medieval thinkers, who would who would be on it? Who were sort of the boldest, yeah, free thinkers of of the era? If we look at Latin Christendom, well, actually, if I'm allowed to mention anyone from Europe, I might mention Maimonides, because he, I mean he lived in the Islamic world, but he was from Islamic Spain, and we haven't mentioned him yet. And he's a great Jewish thinker who has a, a pretty daring rationalist approach to Judaism. So I, I might mention him. I would probably mention, uh, uh, I might mention Abelard for the reason you said. Um, and then I would probably mention Marguerite Poret, who, who I uh, alluded to just a few minutes ago. So maybe I should say a little bit more about her because she might be an unfamiliar name. Um, so like I say, she was put to death early in the 14th century because she wrote a work called The Mirror of Simple Souls, in which she um, actually writes a dialogue where she appears as a character in her own work. Um, she's the soul, and she's meeting these kind of personifications uh, of abstract concepts, like love, for example, who teach her a new way of thinking about God philosophically. So it's a somewhat mystical, but it's very daring. So for example, she talks about religious virtue and um, living a kind of self-controlled, abstemious life, the way that a lot of religious people do, especially in a monastic context, right? And then she says, yeah, yeah, that's all fine and good, but that's not what um, the highest, most liberated, pure soul does, because the, what the highest liberated, pure soul does is to enter into a direct relationship with God. And the problem that she sees with um, the kind of life of mere virtue, as she puts it, is that instead of uh, subsuming your will completely within the will of God so that you kind of annihilate your own ability to make distinct choices, you, you instead of that, you're kind of remaining in the created world and trying to live a, a life of good ethical practice. And again, she's not saying that that's a bad thing to do. She's just saying that you can rise above that to actually unite your will and your soul with the reality of God. So it's this very kind of demanding, um, over-the-top teaching, um, which, has, like I say, has these kind of mystical elements. And this idea that you could rise above virtue was one of the things from the book that was explicitly mentioned by the um, board of 
theologians who judge the book to be heretical. Um, and to give you an idea of what kind of person she was, she wrote a book um, and started disseminating it to aristocrats and even to clergy and got in trouble and they burned the book and told her to stop. So she turned around and wrote a book again, which is the one we've got. It came to the attention of the authorities. They put her in prison and they said, well, we're going to put you on trial. So you have to take an oath um, to be truthful, like you do when you start a trial. And she said, nope, not going to do it. And so she sat there in prison for months while they decided what to do about the fact that she was being so uncooperative that they couldn't even put her on trial. And they finally decided to just put her to death without going through the normal trial process. So she wasn't, she didn't defend herself. They just read the book, said, this is heretical. She hasn't recanted. She should die. And then they put in Paris. So that's pretty bold and daring, I would say. Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. When is your book on, on Rasi out? That's a good question. I've been writing it for years. Um, I'm, I'm determined to try to finish it this winter because I'm taking a research leave to do that. So I'm hoping it will appear maybe 2019. We'll make sure to give it a, a mention here when it, it does come out. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been a pleasure. I've learned uh, a lot and I hope and think the listeners have too. Thanks a lot for having me and uh, congratulations on your series. Thanks. Great. Thanks.